All right, so sampling and distributions. Uh, yeah, sorry, I was a bit late. I had uh, so much wrong today. Um, yeah, if anyone is uh, looking to meet with me before spring break, uh, I think I have like 20 minutes free at like 7 p.m. tomorrow. So it's, it's been that kind of week. Uh, so just keep in mind homework four, uh, the extra credit deadline is actually today. And then the actual homework that you do on the Tuesday, you're back. All right, so kind of long extended homework. Um, and then project one is due tomorrow. Uh, and by the discussion section tomorrow will be an opportunity for any questions you might have, for you to work on it, um, you know, with potentially some side helps uh, from the courts and systems and uh, the TA. Um, and spring break is next week, so I will not be here. Feel free to come and give lectures if you like. Um, but I recommend taking a week off. Uh, what else? Any other any questions? Yeah. Oh, good call. Um, yeah, so attendance would be a good thing. I will use a new poll. Anyone know what it is? All right, polls there. Uh, why don't we do a number? We have a number four. Uh, I think we have a number three, so let's do three. Um, all right, any other questions? So we don't have any new lab, uh, right? There's no lab this week, uh, and the, the homework that you already have is due to Tuesday after break. Any other questions? Do you have a question back there, or do you just have your hand up in the middle, in the very back? Not looking. Okay, definitely doesn't have a question. All right. So then let's continue, to be honest. All right, so just quick review, because I know we, we did it kind of fast last time. Um, so random samples, we have deterministic samples, which is one where we have, oh, sorry. Yeah, the name of this slide should really be samples, um, but we have two different types of samples. We have deterministic samples where basically we specify which ones they are. They don't involve chance. So in other words, this is where I was saying like NPA range, pick every, you know, or using the take method, uh, every thousand one. Okay, so that's a deterministic sample. Sometimes they are necessary, but the vast majority of cases, you're actually looking for a random sample. Uh, random samples come in uh, kind of different types. Um, and one of the big ones, which is commonly used and is very dangerous, that's why we bring it up, is the sample of convenience. Uh, and the sample of convenience is basically whoever walks by. And my example, traditionally I've used this, I think a bunch of times, right? But I'm not necessarily this semester. Um, but if you stand outside a grocery store, you're probably gonna get a slightly better random sample on this, you know, if you're trying to get like the salaries for that area, rather than standing in front of say city hall. Okay, because the likelihood, so even though City Hall does actually have a fair number of people who don't work there going in and out, right? You have to pay a parking ticket, for example, um, but you're still going to have probably a skewed result of a lot of people who work there. And so that may not be representative. So just be careful of them. And that's basically why we want to talk about it. Um, and then we have a bunch of functions, uh, kind of built in functions, and there's more than this as well. Um, but here's a few that are handy um, to, you know, so you have random choice. Um, and then, well, you know, I guess so this is really kind of more general purpose, but random choice will give you a random example, you know, item. So you can use this with categorical, for example, by still using, you know, if you put all of the possible options for your category into a pool, you know, like into an array, then you can use random choice and still get. Uh, some examples out of that. Uh, so the quick example I gave either last lecture or before that was uh, basically uh, whether you have to wake up early or not, um, right? Those were categorical choices, um, but you can randomly sample from them and then use that in turn to randomly sample from the table if you wish. Um, and then the big thing that we are going to do a lot of in this class, I'll tell you right now, almost every homework, lab, project, exam going forward will have at some point this NP append, because what I'm gonna say is, okay, you, I want you to go and sample from that airline data about United, 
and I want you to, you know, figure out the average delay. And then I want you to do it a thousand more times. And I want to, I want to look at the result of the sets of tests. Okay. And so this can be really confusing from a wording perspective when you're reading questions, for example, is just keep in mind, right? Each test may involve like a sample of 500 different flights, okay? but that's one sample. So often we'll want to do a thousand samples. Okay. So if we ask you to do a thousand samples, then that means you have to do the same thing kind of a thousand times, but with getting different elements from the set. Well, potentially different. They could actually be exactly the same in a true random scenario. Every single one of those thousand could be exactly the same, right? Probably not, but it could be. Okay, so we didn't quite get to the distribution of broad times, so we're going to talk about them today. Um, what the leader workspace does, I think it's the first time I've ever gotten a message. All right, so the first, let me just open it over here to you, or start to. Um, so the first thing you want to do is, uh, for this example, is we're going to do some things with dice, okay? And so in order to create a die, right, a die has six faces. Um, and does anybody here know what the, uh, the little dots on a die are called? Really? Nobody? All right, they're called pips. Uh, so, you know, you had one pip up to six pips on each uh, face of the die. Um, okay, so I have now, basically, I'm using this table as if it was a die, right? Uh, and let me open my cheat sheet so that I know what I'm supposed to be talking about. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is let's roll the die 10 times. So who remembers what I method I should use to roll the die 10 times if I want to do it in like as few characters as possible? There are obviously lots of ways to do this. Sample, right. So it's very easy. You can just use sample. And then I get uh, basically, a sample. So essentially, uh, you know, think of it as I rolled the die uh, ten times. Okay, and so here's my result. Okay, um, and then I can also look at it as a histogram. Um, but this is just the the die fate. Like, what are the options, right? And so this is the histogram of the options. I apologize; it doesn't look great. Um, so. This is one of those places where it almost looks like a bar graph, but it's not. Um, and so it can be a little confusing. Uh, but in fact, what's going on here is that the bins are touching. It's just that the, the bins aren't filling. And so it's a little bit weird, uh, but it's just kind of a rendering problem. Um, so what a more interesting histogram might be is if I change the bins and what would say oh yeah so if I change the bins to instead be at the half point okay instead of by default it took the 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 numeric like the whole numbers like one two three if you do it at the half by doing 0 0.5 to 6.6, .6 and then, but each step is one, then it makes it a much nicer looking history. So keep that in mind if you ever want to experiment with it. Um, and when we think about these uh, distributions, right, we can now start to think about, okay, hey, uh, so I rolled the die 10 times. I want to know what that histogram looks like. So why is this useful? Well, a couple things. One, it can kind of help you explore what that data looks like, 
Okay, so doing a histogram on the table itself is useful because then you kind of know what perfect is. But if your sample is maybe not complete or whatever, or you don't want to do that because it's going to take forever to run, you can do things like this. You can pull a sample from it. Now, if you notice though, let me just see. If you notice though, right, or let me ask, let's ask all of you, what's the difference between this histogram and the one I showed prior? Yeah. Because they're kind of a glaring difference. And it doesn't have to do with like bin size. Any ideas? It's not even. It's not even, right? Whereas if we roll a die, most of us think of, you know, the reason you use dice in games is because, a, uh, you know, when you roll it, it comes off, it has an even distribution, right? Um, unless you use weighted dice, so that's not very nice. Um, so this, what does that tell us about the samples we took? That's not enough. That it's not enough. Right. So we only did 10 samples. So as a result, we end up with this really skewed history. So instead, what we can do is kind of, you know, up, up our game a little bit here. Right. So if we do a thousand samples, that gets a lot closer. Right. And so maybe that started to tell us that maybe a thousand samples is a better choice. Um, however, if we go to 10,000 samples, that's really close. Okay. But if you'll recall, right, I think I talked about this last lecture, we want to go as close as possible without going over. So has anybody ever watched the show The Price is Right? No one? Come on. All right. How does Price of Right work? You have to guess the price of something without going over. Right. So uh, if you ever watched The Price is Right, you have to guess the prices of things without going over the price. That's basically what we're doing here. It's like we're kind of guessing the amount of samples we want to take without doing too many samples. Okay. So we're very, very close here. So this is probably sufficient because if you think about it, right? If I go, it's, it's 100,000. If I go to, you know, a million, the difference in the histograms is probably going to be pretty negligible. Okay. So in, um, in, the programming world or like in the tech world and you're starting i think it's actually pervaded others as well now um but we always talk about uh the perfect being the enemy of the good okay so this is good enough okay the other way we often put it is the 80 20 rule so you've ever heard the 80 20 rule or 80 percent and 20 percent rule i don't know how much that's pervaded um but when you think about the software a lot of times uh 80% of the kind of um, work takes 20% of the effort and 20% of the work takes 80% of the effort. It's kind of a rule of thumb. So if you look at this, right, I jumped from like this, which is like complete garbage, right, to this, which is getting in the neighborhood, to this with, you know, kind of a definite uptick in the amount of work that has to be done, right? This is 100,000. It takes longer, even though we couldn't appreciably tell. It takes longer. But if I go, if I try to do that last 20% and try to get it so that they're perfectly even on sampling, that might be running a billion times, right? Because that last bit is really hard to get right. So it's often not worth it. Of course, the rule of when it's not worth it is not exactly easy. But yeah, so that's distributions. Um, we look at distributions a lot in this class, um, and we'll talk more about them later. I'm sure most of you have heard of like a bell curve distribution. We'll talk about that later. Right now, all we're just talking about the fact that it's important to recognize that when we're doing a lot of the work we're doing, we're uh, looking for the distribution of the data across some plane. Right. All right. So, um, catch up on my slides. Oops. Okay. So, this is kind of where we start to get into some of the terminology, um, the probability distribution, all the possible values of the quantity or of the of the thing, right, and the probability of each of those values. Okay. 
So that's the probability distribution that we're talking about. So this is kind of a formal definition. Um, and we also have empirical distributions, uh, or they're kind of like a subset of them is an empirical distribution. So all observed values and the proportion of times each value here. So this kind of gets back to that difference between a numerical uh, set, right, versus a categorical set. Um, so when we talk about a distribution when it's stuck, okay, so like the number of people who have blue eyes versus green eyes versus brown eyes, right, the way we would actually probably be storing that data is by like eye color, right? And so that would be an empirical distribution. Um, the also one of the keywords here is that it's all observed values. So let's say we take our sampling, right, and we um, we actually only get blue eyes and brown eyes. That doesn't mean it's exhaustive. So our our observed values of all that's important when we talk about the empirical distribution, even if there are other values that are possible. Okay. All right, and then we'll go back to large random samples. Okay, so we're first going to pick up that United table again, um, and we're going to insert that uh, basically a row counter. Um, and the lecture should be there. Hopefully, the lecture is working. Um, and so the next thing we're going to do is look at a distribution. And in this case, we decided to make bins. Why do you think that might be, even though I didn't show it to you? Okay. Any guesses? Everybody is definitely ready for spring break. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, maybe if they weren't so small, you wouldn't get that nice curve. Yeah, so if they're too small, they, you wouldn't get a nice curve. Um, a lot of the time, and I don't remember exactly the reason for this, but most of the time, when you have a, a something that looks like this, where there's basically this all this empty space, a lot of this is not actually empty. It's just like there's one like, on some of these numbers, okay? So if you do an even set of distribution or of bins, it's going gonna, it's gonna to kind of throw off what the picture looks like um, by kind of over-representing these. It will still be technically accurate, but from a, from a visual perspective, it may not capture that the vast majority of flight delays are whatever that is, like a few minutes. Okay. So that's kind of why we do it that way. Um, and then you'll see me do this a lot. Where basically I want to know, uh, you know, about this particular uh, set of data. So I'll pull them into the map, um, and I can also pull out the straight average delay. So does anyone know what might be a problem with pulling the average delay based on what I kind of just said a minute ago? It's over influenced by outliers. Right, it's overly influenced by outliers. That was like textbook answer right there. Um, so that 580, right, is minutes. No. Oh, sorry. I was looking at the wrong. I was like, what? Um, sorry, 16. Okay. But that makes you think because it's the average that, that most of the time when you take a flight, it's 16 minutes. But in fact, what is being done is it's being skewed really hard because there's some really big values, even though they're in free flow. And I don't think we talked about the median today, but. Um, the median can be used to counteract that problem. So, um, so kind of going back to my earlier example using the data faces, let's say I don't want to process the whole thing. I want to pull a sample from that. And what this tells us immediately, even though I could actually pull a histogram with the other one, I'd have to get to that information some other way. Because I don't, let's imagine, right, that I can't pull a histogram from the whole data set in any kind of reasonable time. So what I can do is I can look at the mean, the max, the average, the median, and then I can try to pull in a sample and see if this kind of feels right, okay? But if we think about, even though I didn't do the median, even the, the average, like 
this doesn't, at least to me, it doesn't feel right. We have we have some weird outliers. We have this really big spike um, at, you know, I, I happen to know it's around two, okay? Um, so we might want to pull a better sample. Oops. And that seems to start getting a little bit better. What was it, a thousand? Yeah, so a thousand. So that starts to feel like it's a little bit better. We're getting closer to a workable set of data um, that, uh, you know, but is still representative of the actual data set. Okay. This is one of those things that, uh, particularly in project one, you saw a lot, right? Is it's, it's better when you can throw away as much data as possible. So if you don't need that geo column at some point, you don't need that time column at some point, throw it away as soon as possible because it makes all the subsequent things faster um, and potentially less likely to introduce errors because you forgot it was there or whatever. So keep that in mind that we're looking to you know sample it so that we're trying to get to something where we can get the minimum amount of work but still get good answers. All right, and then we can go back to the slides to talk about large random samples. Okay. And so this is called the law of large numbers. So if a chance experiment is repeated many times independently and under the same conditions, then the proportion of times that an event occurs gets the closer, gets closer to the theoretical probability of the event. All right. Has anybody ever heard of the law of averages or sometimes also called gambler's fallacy? Yeah. Where like eventually you'll hit it big. Eventually you'll win, right? So you you keep uh uh like a slot machine, going for the word. You know, you put a quarter in the slot machine, right? You pull the arm and you lose. So you put another quarter in, you pull the arm and you lose. Well, if you lose enough time, right, you're gonna win, right? That's the gambling policy. That is not true. Okay. Uh the 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 stats on it haven't changed, right? The probability of you winning hasn't changed. Um, so this is the gambler's fallacy that there's some, you know, higher being out there that's watching how much you lost and affecting the probability. Uh, this is not the case. Um, and <clears throat> partially for this and partially for the head and tail example, I like to show this video, presuming it will work. Um, so how many people here have ever read Hamlet? All right, does anybody remember the characters Rosencrantz and Guildenstern? The, the right answer is likely no. Oh, but do you know who they were? Or can you tell me who they were? Oh, okay. Yeah. Or do you, but do you already remember who they were? Yeah. They're, they're friends of Hamlet's, right? So, so there are a couple of friends of Hamlet's. They appear kind of early in the play and then they kind of go away and then they kind of appear later on in the play. And so, um, uh, what's the name? It's one of uh, the author of the play. Shakespeare? No, that's Hamlet. Um, but this play, uh, which is kind of explain. But he has a lot of uh, kind of nihilistic plays. Um, and so what he did was wrote a play about what are they doing when they're not on stage? Okay, so like when they're not in the Hamlet play, what do they do? And then somebody came along and made a movie of it. Uh, and this is one of those ones where play is quite good and the movie is also quite good. Uh, so I was going to show a little clip from it because it kind of reflects a little bit of this law of large averages. Um, if we can get the sound. Can you all hear it? He hasn't really said anything yet, but. I think you started to get the point. So we will jump to a little bit later in the play. Or movie. Oops. But that's what I mean. It 
again. Now we see evidence of the gambler fallacy. All right, so this is technically speaking the opposite of what we're talking about. Uh, does anybody know what they're trying to show in this play? With that, like, why are they just heads over and over? Everything's meaningless. That's, everything is meaningless. That's the, that's Kinda, everything is meaningless, right? You give it away with realistic. Um, it, it's it's really that there's just a couple of characters who are sidebars in another play, right? They have no actual existence. So of course it just comes up heads every time. So uh, I think I really like the movie, so strongly recommend it. Um, but the kind of the idea is, you know, if you flip it, right? And and you could actually have a run like that, right? You couldn't just keep flipping heads. Uh, it's probably unlikely, but it does happen. Uh, maybe, you know, to that extent, it's quite a lot. But and I think that whole scene goes on for like two minutes or three minutes and then just flipping the coin. Uh, so you get the idea. All right, so the law of large average, or sorry, the law of large numbers, um, and, oh, actually, here's another quick question. Does anybody know what, what the difference is between a law and a theory? Like the theory of evolution versus the law of large numbers? Law is more like a um, set of principles that makes something absolute, and a theory is like how we think something. That's as far as you, you are on the right track. A law can be mathematically proven. Not necessarily mathematically, but proven. Yeah. Right. So a law is proven. We know this to be true. Okay. So if somebody, I don't remember who, went and actually did the math and proved this to be true. Okay. The problem with the theory of evolution is we can't prove it to be true. There's a lot of people who think it's true. There's a lot of science behind believing it to be true, but at the end of the day, technically it's not proven, okay? So just be careful because one of the challenges with science, right, is that scientists, if they're good, only say things that are true. So for example, the theory of evolution, no one will say that it is a law, okay? Even though most people believe that it is because it's technically not. Okay, so this is one of the problems we have, especially with something like data science, where people don't understand how we got where we're going, okay? So when we say something is a theory, a lot of people interpret that to be, oh, there's a chance it's not true. Well, yeah, there's a chance it's not true, but the size of that chance is sometimes like this, right? So we try to offset that with things uh, that we'll talk about later in the like future lectures called p-values um, and things like that to try to indicate our confidence. Right, because it's a lot easier to say, hey, you know, we think, or it's better to say we have a theory of blah, right? But we are 98.9% .9 confident we're correct. Okay, because that, that gives you a very different feeling than we're 60% confident that we're correct, right? All right, so moving on. All right, so. Basically, the law of large numbers is kind of the formal way of what we were just kind of talking about when I was showing the Jupiter notebook, which is that how do we know if we have a big enough sample to qualify to like fall into the law of large numbers? Um, and in and what what we care about here, right, is that we want the empirical distribution to match the real distribution or the like the sample to match the real distribution. Um, and so you see this in medical trials a lot, right? Um, they don't test every drug on every human. What they do is they test drugs, for example, on a set of humans um, and hope that, that, or don't hope, but try to mathematically prove that testing it on this size of a set will be enough to say that it's true. And we'll actually talk about the COVID vaccine in particular uh, soon. Not today. Um, as, as an example of how how that math works. Um, uh, does anybody know, like, uh, we'll talk about control experience later. So I'll get into that soon. All right, so a little bit more on the terminology front, okay? Um, and this, the first one here is particularly confusing. 
because we have kind of two definitions of the two formal definitions of the word parameter. Okay, so we have a parameter and a method. Okay, that's the thing you pass in on a method is called the parameters. Um, but we also have a parameter when we talk about data. Okay, and so a parameter is a number associated with the population, and a statistic is a number calculated from the sample or calculated. Okay. So can anyone give me examples of what might be the difference between those two things on some population? Say a population of, uh, I don't know, people with uh, blue and, you know, brown eyes. The parameter is a different class, but like usually the parameter is like mu, which is the variables so that be like, an entire population of people, like a large proportion of people who have brown eyes, would be like very same thing. And the statistics can like vary because, like, the mean of a of a sample would be like to thirty people, and like the average number of like brown eyes is like thirty five percent of the population. Right. So, so what you're kind of getting at is like if you if you know that the number of people with blue eyes in the entire world is six that's a parameter like it is a hard fast fact right it is something that you can count up it is a it's associated with the population whereas the average of people with blue eyes is a statistic even if it's on the real thing okay because it's calculated and so basically it's like if you can count it it's generally a parameter like it's a parameter but if you have to calculate it or you're doing it from a sample, for example, when you're trying to extrapolate whatever, then it's just a statistic. A super easy word to make sense. Okay, so we use statistics a lot, as you might imagine, right, to try to estimate a parameter. All right, and then an inference is another one. Um, and so this is the kind of formal way of saying we estimated something. Right. So it's the inference is that we say we make conclusions based on data and random samples. And so we use existing data to guess the value of an unknown number and create an estimate of the unknown quantity. Okay. So, you know, maybe we go and sample, you know, in the city of Boston, uh, all the, every single person in Boston, uh, we find out what color eyes they have. Okay. And we try to extrapolate from that what is the overall world population of eye color. Okay. Probably not going to work very well, but you get the idea. All right. So, oh, we do talk about even so. <laughs> Okay, so the first thing we do is we're just going to look the median, okay? And if you'll recall, the average was about 16, okay? And the median is a 2, okay? So the fact that those are far apart from each other tells us one thing, and the fact that when they're close together tells us another thing. So what does it tell us when they're far apart? And we kind of mentioned this already. Any ideas? Yeah, back there. If they're far apart, the data isn't normally distributed. If they're close together, it's pretty close to normally distributed. Yeah, so it's not normally distributed. That is true, but there's like a simpler answer. Like there's a more generic answer. Which is basically there are outliers. You have outliers, right? So so all like every little bit of it, right, could be normally distributed. So if you like looked at it, it looks like it. But then you have this one point like way over here, right? That's an outlier. Um, so really it's just the fact that there's outlay. So in that example, for example, um, it may be valid to throw out that outlier because there's there's might be an error in how you got that outlier, for example, right? So basically if you pull the median and pull the average, and they're close together, it means that you don't have a lot of outliers, okay? Or or you have outliers on both sides that are really even, right? Or it means, and or if they're close together, you know, it means they're kind of close together, but if they're uh if they're wildly different, it'll be skewed. Okay. 
doesn't often tell you which way they're skewed. So like where the outliers are. Okay. So um, what we do next is we can start to take our samples just like we do with the average. We can now pull a sample and compare it to our original median. And maybe that'll tell us a little bit more about this population or about the sample size, is it good or not? Um, and, oh, that's funny. So in my, uh, my cheat sheet, this is where randomness comes in for you. Um, my answer, my answer for this one was 10.5 versus 1.5. So clearly that sample is terrible, right? Because I shouldn't get medians that are like wildly different if I can pull two different samples and get such big differences. Um, okay, so yeah, it was so different that I just, I thought I made a mistake. So why don't we make a function which will calculate a median with a sample that is variable or a size sample that is variable by but I really should have just copy and pasted from the prior line. I'd be less likely to have errors and it would fit my laziness. Um, so what would this allow us to do? We can now write something that can kind of circle experiment with size, right? Without having to go back and rewrite the code over and over again. Um, we can now just call that one method um, and try it out. Okay, so I ran sample median. So I did exactly the same thing as I did uh, whatever, a couple lines back, and I got a wildly different answer. So I got a 3.5 this time, but we do know that it's, it seems like it's doing the right thing. And I don't have any errors. So what do you think we might want to do next? Any ideas? What can we try now? So let's say for the sake of argument that we think that this uh, median calculation using a sample size of 10 uh, is good enough, right? And so I kind of hinted at this earlier, but there's randomness in here, right? So what may, might we want to do if we want to maybe try out a sample size of 10 and see if we can get, get better answers? How can we introduce some randomness or how can we take advantage of the randomness to try to get to a better answer? Because we, we know we don't like the three and a half or the one and a half or the ten and a half that I got, right? Because they're not that close. We're trying to calculate a statistic to estimate the parameter. We have to know the parameter is two. But what is what what might be a good idea to try next? Anyone? We did this last lecture. I mentioned it at the beginning of the lecture. Like making a random choice. Sorry. Like making a random choice. Okay, so a random choice of what? Like we're we're already calling the sample, which is a random set of ten rows from the United data. So where? What do you like? So we're already we have some randomness. So what we might we want to do with that randomness to get a better answer? Or a better statistic value. Oh, sorry. Um, like repeat it. Repeat it, right? So what we can do when we're not sure if it's going to be great on its own, because we're dealing with randomness, maybe we could just try it a whole bunch of times and see if we start to get a better answer. Okay. And so that's what we're going to do um, using our fancy new for loops. We're going to do it a thousand times to give it a try. Um, and so for each of those thousand, each of those thousand tries, we're going to um, call our sample median function again. Uh, but we're just going to keep using the same sample size of 10. Okay. And then I need to collect those somewhere. Otherwise, it's kind of worthless, right? Because they're going to get, it's going to get overwritten every time I write that for loop. So I want to append them into um, the array I already set up. So np append 
Okay. Does anybody know a, a potentially simpler but potentially harder to read way I could have done this? Any ideas? All right, I'll just tell you. Um, I could have just gotten rid of that line and just put it, put the call and method right there, right? I just just keep adding it right there. But conveniently, I noticed that my friends are wrong. Okay, so now I have an array of a thousand where I Basically, this, this is what I was saying gets a little confusing, I think, for a lot of people. So each position in that array is one run of my sample medium. So, right, it's like I went and took a 10, I took 10 random uh, rows from the United table, then I asked for the median of it, and then that was the result. Okay, so each of these represents one run of the sample size of 10. Okay. And I should have limited the output on that one. All right, so instead, I can make it look a little bit nicer by throwing it into a table and then looking at a histogram. Okay, and so, excuse me. And so, in a sense, even though it's not great, does anybody notice uh, what is starting to happen here? Like, like it's getting better. Right? Because we know the right answer is two, which would be about here, right? And our histogram is actually falling into there. So if I do enough, even though I'm only doing a sample size of 10, I did it a thousand times and it's starting to get close-ish to the correct answer, right? So it seems like it's still not enough, okay? But it's getting there, right? It, it's a lot better than when I just did it once, right? So, what if I do basically the exact same thing, which I'm going to copy and paste because otherwise I'll be here in the rest of my life. But I'm not going to print it this time because it's going to take up a lot of space. But instead, let's take a sample size of 1,000, okay? So each time we run through it, we're actually going to do a sample size of a thousand. We're going to pull that median, do it, and then we're going to add it to our array, and then we're going to turn that into a table. So that's going to take a second to run, right? And here's like I don't know if you saw the star. Um, actually, I want to point it out and do it again, just make you look at it. Um, so you didn't even notice it go by when we were doing a sample size of ten. Here, it's not taking that long, but it's appreciable. Right, like we're we're starting to do some damage. Okay, so this is why we don't want it to get too fast. All right, we don't want then these numbers to get too big because even when we're doing this little bit of change, right, all we're doing is we're doing a thousand tries of a thousand size sample. That seems to be even work right there. Okay, so we'll throw that into a histogram. And as you can see, now our answer is starting to get really good. Okay. So our statistic is getting really close to the parameter. That makes sense. Thanks. And then I wanted to try to bring it, uh, you know, a little bit more local. Um, so. Mm 
me just see because we're almost out of time, right? Let's see how much I don't know. Yeah, we're going Okay, we might be able to just so this is a little bit oops, um a little bit more basic, but it just starts to give you uh some of the things we can do with the tools we've kind of built. So um if you go to data.boston.gov, you can go and download a bunch of data about the city. Uh, one of the things that you can go download is the Blue Bikes data. Okay, so we all know Blue Bikes. You can go grab the Blue Bikes data. It is a lot of data. So the sample that you have is actually a sample of that data. It is actually a manually curated sample. So it is definitely invalid for some conclusions. I kind of forced it to make certain conclusions. Uh, so uh, you know, take it with a grain of salt from a data perspective. If you really want to experiment with it, go get the source rather than uh, the one I do. Um, so, just to, oh, just to give you a sense of the data. Uh, so, in this, we have how long the ride took place in minutes, when the ride started, when the ride stopped, where it started from. Okay, so each station has an ID um, and the kind of long name. Then the Latin long of the start, and then basically all the same stuff for the uh, uh, the other end, um, and then yeah. we also have a bike ID. Okay, so this is a unique identifier per bike, and then we have the type of person who used it. And when I say type, I mean like somebody who pays like a monthly fee, or somebody who's paying like per ride. And subscriber is is monthly, and per ride is customer. There might be one other column over there. Okay. Okay, but so that's that table. So let's take a little bit of what we have learned such so far. Um, and we can say, all right, maybe we're interested in where like where are people taking short trips? Okay. So in other words, what might you think short trips would be to would be maybe these are commute times. Okay, so people taking the bikes to get to work, right, or home from work, uh, because you're likely, you know, if you want to go on a Saturday jaunt, right, for 10 miles, um, that's going to be a much longer trip than uh, something that you might do for a normal commute, typically. Um, so somewhat arbitrarily, and also from looking at the data, I can say, Uh, where clause, and let's say I want all the trips that are less than a thousand minutes long. Okay. So, 20 is a thousand. Oh, wait a minute. I misspoke. I do this every time. Um, okay. they, these are actually seconds, not minutes. So, I want all the trips that are less than a thousand seconds. So, what would I write here to get all the trips that are less than a thousand seconds? There he is. You use this lunch. Yeah. Or not below. Or not below. All right. And I can print a histogram of that. That might be a little too short, but you get the idea. Um, however, let's make it a little bit nicer. Sorry, it just doesn't look right to me. Um, okay, so uh, now we're going to kind of change that inside so it's a little bit more readable. Um, and so what we can start to calculate is, um, hey, let's see how many people actually took a trip duration of, and remember the probability stuff we were doing before. Let's say, okay, we know we want the number of people who have a trip duration between 500 and 250 seconds. Okay, well then we can take that histogram bin, right? We can say 500 minus 250, what we said, right? And we can multiply that by how much is in that bin, okay? And so we can kind of look here 
Okay, because we know uh, the size of the bins when we say it's it's basically 0.15. I'm not liking this example though. Um, and basically, so that tells us the percent of people who are in that range, right? So maybe what we want to know is like, huh, okay, well, we know there's a bunch of different stations. Would it make sense to add some stations if we knew kind of the pattern of the people who are using the device to commute? Maybe we need some more stations, right? Or maybe we maybe we can actually get rid of some stations. So this is the kind of data we would use to look at are the stations in the right places for the way people commute. Um, and I believe this data is pre-pandemic. Uh, so, oh no, this is during the pandemic. But then we can also look at other cool things like, let's say, all right, what station is are people starting from but then taking really long trips or really short trips but in this case i'm going to show it in terms of really long trips so how would i now look at all the trip durations like, like, like what or actually it's really different um the question is really more like what station has the most like kind of minutes out of it. Any ideas? Like, or understand what I'm saying? It's like, it's like what stations use the most for the longest amount of trips? And like I said, I'm not loving this example. I think I'm going to move on. Um, because it's it's a little contrived. Um, but long story short, you can also you can group by station, right? And then say, hey, I'm going to actually count up all the trip durations coming out of that station. So that would be a really sad station to remove. Okay? Um, and so how we do that, we can very easily say start station name just for ease of reading. But then we can sort it by counts. And then we so I don't know if you noticed, but on that original table, I didn't have anything called count, right? But group automatically gives me a column called count unless I tell it to use something else. So right there is kind of like built in. And so in other words, the most commonly used station is that one at MIT and uh, Mass Avenue and Hurt Street, and the next one is at Central Square and Harvard Square, et cetera. So these are the most viewed stations in this sub portion of the blue light data, uh, which is almost definitely not not a good representative sample because, like I said, I, I munched it. Um, but it, it could very well still be true. But as you can see, right, so we know these stations are ones we want to keep uh, for sure, but then we can kind of I said it's really the story that's broken, but I think what you can do with it is is really pretty cool. Um, so I can actually look at hey, let's look at a pivot table about the um, start station names and the end station names. So now I'm going to get a grid like this, right? Eventually, um, that tells us the end stations and the start stations and how many how many uh, different trips we get out of it, right? So it's basically it's the count of every time those match. But then lastly, I was going to kind of get to is that you can make sure you do a map as well. But that's in a second. So this is now that same set of combinations, except now we can look at in terms of the durations between them. And then lastly, I have a station table, which is just more details about each station. For example, the Latin long, which I believe is actually on the original table, but I can actually put those into a map and draw the picture of them, which is okay, but what would be really cool is actually to be able to show maybe the lines between the different stations that we keep on using. So except for the map, everything that we did before, we've already covered. Like if you can do all this stuff yourself, you can go mess around with all this data and figure out, you know, if you were interested in where, uh, you know, where a blue bike's most commonly used, 
or perhaps more interestingly, if you like using blue mice, um, where you're likely to be able to get a blue mice. So in other words, the least commonly used stations would be really useful if you want to go pick up a blue mice, right? And kind of vice versa, when you want to drop one off, it's really useful to know the least common endpoint for blue mice stations, because then you know you're likely to be able to drop it off there. So and it was more to just kind of show you some examples of what you can already do with what you have already learned with any of these data sets. If you have these kinds of random questions, you can go figure it out, assuming you, you can get the data. Um, but I think we had one more slide, but I think that's pretty much all I'm going to talk about. Uh, two more slides. Um, so the probability distribution of the statistic. So when we're sampling for the distribution or probability distribution of the statistic, it's all possible values and all the corresponding probabilities. It can be hard to calculate. So you can either do the math or you can generate all possible samples and calculate the statistic based on each sample. As you can imagine, I usually choose the latter. Right? I just go and actually do the experiment because computers are much easier for me to acquire than me to sit down and do math forever. So, um, yeah, so this is mostly about uh, kind of formal definition. And then the empirical distribution of a statistic um, is based on the simulated values of the statistic or all the observed values, oh, sorry, based on the simulated values of the statistic, all the observed values of the statistic, the proportion of times each value was observed. And it can be a good approximation to probability distribution of the statistic if the number of repetitions, repetitions is large. So this is kind of just mostly a really wordy way of saying these are the formal definitions around like when you're talking about when you do the sampling techniques, if you do it for large enough numbers, you start to get really good uh, approximations of parameters. Okay? And that's really important for what we're trying to do. Because like I said, even, even that simple example I gave, you start appreciably noticing how long it takes. Um, so as soon as you start making that a more complex question, it really starts to deteriorate pretty fast. Um, in fact, the kind of the academic side of data science is in a lot of ways about making uh, those calculations, for lack of a better term, simpler or shorter or easier to do. Um, that's it. Uh, just the announcements, um, and we'll see you in a week. Um, some of you are like that tomorrow, but. Otherwise, oh, wow. yeah, you know, 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 you know,